Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee, and I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on silver today. We will hear from Silver Viper Minerals uh, CEO, uh, Steve Koch. Uh, during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook. And then we will take questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first, we need to discuss some fine print uh, during this uh, Silver Viper webinar. Forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the Silver Viper corporate presentation. That can be found on the company's website, silverviperminerals.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research lo located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures pertaining to Silver Viper. Uh, before Steve steps in, I would like to say a few words about silver. Uh, silver is trading here at a bit over $19 an ounce, uh, and the gold-silver ratio is currently around 87, a little higher than it has been uh, in recent years. Uh, silver relative to copper is also just as important as silver relative to gold. Silver is unique. It's both a precious metal and an industrial metal, so there can be good correlation between silver and copper prices as well. Uh, looking at mine production, the majority of gold production comes from gold mines, whereas silver mine production is driven quite a bit by uh, byproduct production. Uh, the largest driver of, of silver mine supply comes from zinc mining, 35 percent, uh, primary silver mines, about 30 percent, copper mines, and then gold mines. As base metal production declines, expect silver production to be under pressure as well. Uh, the declining copper mine supply is driving copper prices, and it should also uh, drive silver prices. Uh, then looking at physical demand and substitution, what is important to know here is that when gold and silver prices rise, jewelry consumption often falls. 45% of physical gold demand is from jewelry, whereas only 27% of silver demand is from jewelry. Uh, there isn't that much pressure from retail. Not to mention those that once bought gold jewelry may now look uh, to silver. Uh, silver use in, in, in industry isn't as elastic due to its electrochemical properties. Uh, its best substitutes uh, would be gold, platinum, and palladium, which are significantly more expensive. A large shift into renewable energy technology is taking place globally, and silver is needed for solar panels, batteries, and other electronics. And as demand for renewables increases, it's natural to assume that silver's industrial demand will increase in the coming years. Finally, there's strong investment demand. While the recent fiscal tightening has pulled down uh, precious metals prices, uh, when we emerge from this era, we might expect investment demand to strengthen along with industrial recovery. And we expect this to support the price of silver in the longer term. Uh, so with that said, I now turn it over to Steve uh, to update our audience on Silver Viper Minerals. Yeah, thanks, Timothy, and thanks, everyone, for taking time today to, to view the webinar. Uh, I think we, yeah, we definitely are at a very interesting crossroads in our sector and, and with what's happening in the world, and, and I agree with a lot of what Tim just said, and you know, I think there's going to be a lot of industrial demand moving forward for silver. It's already being produced at a deficit to what's being consumed, and so I think it is just a matter of time before you really see the, the price of silver especially really break out. Um, with that being said, I'll, I'll talk a bit about what we're doing at Silver Viper, and then when we're done, we can open it up for some questions and engage with everyone that's, that's viewing. I will be making some forward-looking statements, as we already talked about, so you know, for everyone, you can draw your attention to that slide. When you're looking to invest in a precious metals exploration company, I think there's three things you really need to focus on. One, that it has a high-quality asset. Two, that it has lots of potential. And three, that it has a strong management and shareholder group behind the project. In our case, we certainly have all, all three of those. The high quality asset is the La Virginia project located in eastern Sonora. Um, you take a paved highway from Hermosillo, which is an international airport, uh, to the local town of Nicori Chico, and from there, about 30 minutes in on a gravel and dirt road to our camp. Um, we got involved with this project in 2018. In our first phase of drilling, we made 
you know, a major discovery on the project in the zone called El Ruby. But this project was a, you know, a project that had some exploration on in the past done by mine finders and the Pan American Silver. Mine finders, you know, flew this whole mountain range in Sonora looking for another Dolores mine, which was their flagship operation, which they were bought by Pan American for 1.5 billion. They settled on La Virginia being the lookalike for the Dolores deposit. And it sits about hundred kilometers to the south, just across the border into Chihuahua. Um, and then the only other modern operation in the area is to our north, about 90 kilometers. In between, there's nothing. There's been no modern exploration. Most of this mountain range is fairly inaccessible, and that's why you haven't seen the, the level of exploration that you have in the rest of the state. But where we are, we have very good access. We have good infrastructure. We have a brand new power line corridor going through the heart of the project. We've got water year round. Um, we've got the local community support and, and different communities that provide us with a workforce and supplies. And then, you know, the drilling company we've been using is based in Hermosillo. So anytime anything goes wrong with the drill rig, we're down for hours and not days like you would see on a lot of other projects. As far as the potential, we came out with our maiden resource on the project. We were very excited and, and thrilled with the size of that maiden resource, but it is just a start. Um, we plan on updating that resource next year based on the drilling that's been done, you know, after that resource and as well you know, we have hired a new geologist recently and she's gone in and really dug into the database and thinks that there's a lot of room to improve some of the wire frames and different things that were used especially in the historic area and the you know the area part of the project the mine fires of pan american were um, exploring so again we think we can upgrade the resource on that note but then also we've expanded the el ruby area you know by you know three four or five hundred meters at least of strike length and we've filled in gaps. So again, I think we can upgrade that resource and look for a larger number there. And then we've got a you know, bunch of areas that we've made some interesting hits on that are away from El Ruby up in that portion of the project that we'll continue to drill and might be able to bring into a maiden resource as well. Um, Strong Management Shareholder Group, it's part of the Belcara Group, which gives us advantage over a lot of our peer companies. We've got three public companies under our group's management that allows us to share our GNA costs keep those costs lower, making sure more of the money goes into the ground and exploration where it belongs. Um, a staple of all the Belcare companies is management owning over 20%. We're active, we buy in the market, we participate on placements. We believe the best place to invest our money is in ourselves and in our group of companies that we know the best. We have lots of strong institutional support. There's over 20 different funds that own the stock. We've had a lot of retail support, especially out of the US as we've been, you know, through COVID and doing a lot of webinars and marketing, and it's it's built up a fairly good following that way, and still a relatively low share count around a, actually around 100 million shares. Again, here you can see where the project is. This is a picture of the the La Virginia area of the project, which is closer to where Mine Finders and Pan American are exploring. Where we made our discovery was another five kilometers to the north on the El Ruby Plateau, which you'll see on a slide coming up. Um, again, great access to the project. It is a fairly mountainous area, but where we made our discovery at El Ruby, what's important is that is a flat plateau. And when you look at our resource and see the grade, that, that starting resource was built around an open pit heap leach mine, which isn't as great in the steep terrain here where, you, where mine finders and Pan American were exploring, but on that flat plateau, it has a lot of benefits. Um, you don't have a pit wall on the southern side as you come down the arroyo and continue to follow the mineralization. And it's just, it's very attractive and very nicely set up for an open pit heat leach operation. And then going underground afterwards on the high grade structures. Here you can see our option agreement. Every, you know, we look at our claims package there in red. We own everything in red 100% already. We gave Pan American Silver a 2% NSR that gave us access to the full database. All the old historic core is stored in warehouses in Hermosil that we now control. We have the whole database. Um, and then the claims in blue, which is where the bulk of the historic work was done. We did a, a deal with a private Mexican group, and you can see there we made the first four payments. We have one final larger payment um, due June of next year. Half of that can be paid in shares at our discretion. Uh, we've certainly found more than enough to warrant that payment. We also, there's just a 2% NSR only on the blue claims, which we have the right to buy back for $2 million in the first five years or $3 million for the life of the project after that. Here you can see a picture of that El Ruby Plateau where we made that discovery. What you get along this project, and this, this was our number one exploration target when we took over the project, um, you see these large silicified dikes 
uh, for those that sticks out kind of like a sore thumb, but this would be it, this, this item that I'm circling there. Um, those outcrop and run, you see those going for, you know, over a hundred kilometers along strike here on this project. And they out, you see these solidified dikes and our mineralization tends to happen adjacent and into those dikes. Um, you get the dike and then next to it, you'll get a breccia structure, which is our high grade structure. And then in the case of El Ruby into the foot wall, you get the broad low grade mineralization, then a hundred meters to the West for scale. This, um, this plateau is two kilometers by two kilometers. So it's, it's very large, but we made our Western zone discovery a hundred meters to the West of that. Um, that dike there that you can see in the image. And then we hit another 100 plus meter wide zone of that kind of gram, gram and a half gold material. And it, it's that zone, that foot wall, and then that high grade zone that really make El Ruby special. You know, it, it produces it at a grade that's much higher than the other heat leach operations in the area that are operating at about a half gram gold average grade. And so it, it is a very attractive starting target where a mining company will get, you know, a fairly quick payback on their capex and then can go and, like I said, explore underground as we develop that resource. I mean, uh, there's not too much to hire. You can hear, you can see some of our regional targets that we're very high on right now. I would say El Molino was probably our top target. We've hit a lot of really nice stuff in our sampling program over here on the southern end of El Molino, some very high graded surface. One of the things that we found a lot of the, over most of this project is that surface, you don't see a ton of grade in these structures. You get down to certain levels and then the grade really picks up. So seeing some high grade material at El Molino at surface is a great start. And then our geophysics program that we completed a few months ago also really highlighted how interesting that El Molino area up at Peridonis, um, a couple of blind targets in between El Ruby and Peridonis that we you know, may have saw some sniffs with our surface sampling, but they're really lit up in the geophysics. And then at the far end of the plateau under Ruby North, we continue to sample our structure, you know, it's that same structure from El Ruby that runs there and it samples and we hit grade off of the plateau as well. So there's lots of room for strike potential and, and these resources to grow by fairly substantial numbers as we have drilling success. Macho Libre is another exciting area. It's about two kilometers of strike length potential. We've put a few holes in the Macho Libre and hit sniffs of mineralization, certainly hit some nice breccia structures, but it looked like we were high in the system when we hit those. So I think some deeper holes are warranted over certain parts of Macho Libre. And we'll just continue to do our mapping and sampling there to vector in on where we think the best spot to put those holes will be. Here you can see that that pit outline as of the resource. Again, we've expanded that and filled in more of that as you come off south to the bottom of the Arroyo. Again, some of the stuff from our geophysics. And one of the models that we've really worked on here is that there's going to be a deep feeder system for El Ruby. We, you know, we follow our high grade structures through the anisites. We get into the rhyolites and the structures are still there. It's a tighter package, so you don't get the as big of widths and grades as you do up in the anisite package. But as you get below that rhyolite package, you should get into either another andesite package or to a meta sediment package. And at that, on this type of deposit is where you can really hit some bonanza grades and widths. And one of the things that lit up right off the bat was this deep target that you can see here on line 1000. For those, yeah, you can see it circled there. That is a very compelling target that we'll be testing in our next phase of drilling on the project, trying to find the feeders for that El Ruby zone. And then, as again, I mentioned, we found some blind targets on our geophysics between El Ruby and Peridonis, and you can see them up here on line 800, an example of some of those blind targets that you see, so like I said, some sniffs on surface, but you can see some of the surface sampling here, and you'll get like the odd green dot here or there, but nothing really big from our soil lines. Um, but underneath that surface there, it looks like there's some very viable targets as well. The other thing that we've always kind of known about from our magnetics is that we definitely have something under El Ruby that you don't see on surface. You can see this triangular shaped structure here. Um, our geologists would interpret that that's a, a buried intrusion that certainly be some of the source of mineralization coming up that intrusion. But it's not something you see at surface. And what's been interesting is that both of those trends sit on the periphery of that buried intrusion. Um, you see Macho Libre, El Ruby, Ruby North, and then El Molino, Peridonis on the other side. And so that is very important structure to understand and see, but it's not something you see at surface. It's definitely, you know, down below probably help form that plateau than the shape that it is. But again, very important for our finding the roots is, is sitting there on the periphery of that intrusion. 
I won't spend too much time again. I mean, here we are just going through a lot of these different slides from our geophysics and compelling targets. And, you know, I can keep saying that over and over again, but you can review these and reach out to the company with questions as, as, you, as you look at them. And here I mentioned our favorable horizon is that andesite agglomerate. Um, we get that our ruby structure, the retro structure on the eastern end of that. That's what runs, you know, our kilogram plus silver numbers with high grade gold. And then into the foot wall on the western side, you get like a 40 to 80 meter wide zone. And then another western, the western zone, 100 meters to the west. And then you see that Riley package. And then it's the package below that that we want to get into that'll have, you know, be potential where the feeder is coming from you get those fluids coming up and they're going to hit that tight rhyolite package. And then along that contact, you're going to get this, should get this big blowout of mineralization and grades is kind of the logic behind the, the model. This is kind of a, an example of, you know, how, where we would sit in that model. You know, you get the high grade gold and silver, you know, close to surface. Um, in our case, we get, you know, high grade gold and silver high in the zone, then 300 meters down, we're still in high grade gold and silver with very little base metals. And that was kind of the hint that we were onto something different than your traditional Mexican epithermal system. And it's down deeper. And especially if it's that meta sediment package that touches the rhyolites, you get that carbonate gold base metal deposit down deeper. Um, and the carbonate comes from the, you know, the limey sediments or the meta sediments. But we're very excited to, you know, look into that model we had crescat take a large position in the company based on quentin henning doing a deep dive under ca into our database and he started relating it to these similar deposits around the world that are multi-million ounce gold deposits you can see a couple of them listed here on the left in Papua New guinea the kelly and mine you know all these are greater than four million ounces greater than six million ounces of precarious deposit like these are these are major deposits um, Dolores is a good example of one of these where you had stuff at depth that ended up making, you know, the mine what it is. So we're very excited about this model and this idea. And again, we'll be testing that this year. This, I mean, again, hints that we're onto stuff. What we see in parts of our breach of structure and stuff is these sulfides that have been blasted up from deeper in the system when they came in, but we'll get, you know, a half meter of this where we get, you know, a bit of base metals, but the half meter on either side of it still runs high grade gold and silver, but it has no base metals. And so it's these where you get these sulfides blasted up from deeper into some of those structures that you really start to see the base metal components pick up with some very nice grades. I mean, I, one of the cool things that we've been able to do here and why we were able to get into El Ruby and I guess why mine finders and Pan American never, you know, in the past explored El Ruby was the use of these man portable drill rigs. When they were working on the project, they were using large track mounted rigs, bulldozing and roads. It was more expensive exploration, but the technology has come a long way with these man portable rigs. We can take these down, you know, if we really wanted to push it, we could take it down a thousand meters. Uh, we don't, we haven't obviously been doing that, but you can keep very good core, very wide core. Um, and, you know, we, once you're in on the project, the guys move them by hand. It's very quick moving and demoving. And, you know, we're, we're permitted to drill on the project through Semernet anywhere we kind of want. Um, we reuse the lumber. So from an ESG standpoint, like it's a very low environmental footprint. We use mules to carry the core and the fuel in and out of the project or in and out of the drill pads. Um, so it's been a great, you know, tool for us in this area. And, and Global Explorer has been a great partner for the company as well in doing that drilling. Again, here you can see a lot of the high grade results we see from our breccia and then a few examples of the, the broad low grades. You know, these are these are spectacular results. And we hope as again, as you know, if these are what we're seeing at surface and the model is that you're gonna hit bonanza grades down at depth, you know, we're very excited about what those results could look like if we find that feeder and that model holds true. Again, some more of the, the rock type and looking at some of the core with, you know certain things in those sulfides and some of these bits of core but it's it's been a really fun project for us to to work and be on to something a bit different in mexico than what we're used to here you can see that resource and i and i one of the things i really like to hammer home about this starting resource is that it was targeted around an open pit deposit the average open pit heap leach mine again in the area operates about a half gram gold average grade you can see our gold grade alone sitting there at around point well we've got 0.78 in the indicated and 0.9 in the inferred at El Ruby, we've got another, you know, half gram gold 
of silver equivalent um, in that as well on top of that. So we've got a great starting resource here for an open pit that again will grow on a future resource. And then we're gonna look to start developing the underground resource at the El Ruby area. And, and one of the things you can see that there was these blocks that were just outside of that open pit. If you were actually mining it, you would take a shovel and scoop them up. But you know that material that was outside of that, I think around 15 grams gold and like 300 grams silver, and the, but it just wasn't enough tons to start an um, underground resource. So those are the types of grades and widths you can see as you follow that breccia structure and that we could potentially develop as we move underground. But, you know, it's a great starting resource. It should be very attractive for any of the, you know, companies that are doing open pit heap leach mining in the state. A lot of them start at about a half million ounces of gold, which, you know, on an equivalent basis, we're already there, you know, on this project and then some. So out of over about 700,000 right now. So again, I think it's very attractive, you know, for the smaller mid-tier gold producers. And as we grow that resource, then it'll open up the doors for a lot of those big gold companies that have taken notice. They've been done, a lot of them have done site visits to the project and really like it. And they just want to see, you know, those tons and great, you know, just not great, but the tons be added and ounces be added to get up to the, you know, the scale that they're looking for for their deposits. So. Again, it's been a great, fantastic start for the company, and we're excited to you know bring out a new resource next year and, and continue to grow this deposit and then make some new discoveries on the surrounding areas. This, this is another slide that kind of holds in line with that model that we were talking about. You can see high up this hole, especially we had high up, we were hitting you know gold and silver with very low base metals. And then 300 meters down, we hit you know one of our best intercepts, but I think that is the best intercept to date on the project. Um, was this was hole 289 and you had a you know again 100 and whatever meters of 130 meters of you know 0.7 grams gold with some silver and then right below it you had you know 19.3 meters of 360 grams silver and 21 grams gold um, and then high up in the zone you had another broad low grade system so you get this vertical component where you should traditionally see the base metals really picking up but you don't on this deposit yet and again we think that'll come at that deeper contact here you can see the pit model and where the drilling was as of the resource. We filled in this gap all the way down to the bottom now. So again, there's gonna be a lot of ounces built on the southern end of the pit. You can see some of those intercepts that we had that were outside of, you know, they just weren't spaced enough to be included in the resource at the bottom of that arroyo. And then as we move to the north, the geophysics has really opened that back up again too. It seems that our mineralization shifts to the east. Um, there's some cross faulting that goes on in this area along that along that structure. And those cross faults are actually very important because some of our best grades are where we intercept those cross faults with our main structure. But, you know, it, it, it does seem that it's shifted to the north and that the drilling we did on the northern end of El Ruby would have missed, you know, where the deposit is gone. So we'll be going back in and I think we're gonna continue to expand that pit to the north as well, which will open up, you know, a lot more ounces. Metallurgy is always very important and, and should be a question on everyone's mind when they're looking at any of these precious metals companies. Our you know, first pass at metallurgy was superb. Gold recoveries all above 90% across all the grade ranges. And even the silver leaching very well. And again, this is the type of metallurgy you'd be looking at in a, you know, for the open pit heap leach style mining. But you know, the low grade silver leaching at 76% is fantastic. So that, that is definitely a component. Some of these types of deposits, not these types, but some of the open pit heap leach deposits in the state, they have they struggle to recover the silver. Um, so seeing that and our silver coming coming out at that type of percentage is great because that'll be an important component to the open pit heap leach. And then I would I would anticipate a secondary circuit for that really high grade material. And we're gonna do, we are doing some metallurgical work on that front as well. I mentioned the Belcara group. The last kind of big sale within the group was Orco Silver Corp, um, the La Preciosa deposit. We sold that in a bidding war between Coor and First Majestic for over 350 million US. That was a project we put the very first drill hole into and grew it to over 270 million ounces of silver. Um, Avino actually just bought that deposit from Coor um, and we'll be looking to use a lot of the high grade material there for fill at their deposit, but it's definitely a, a outstanding deposit in Durango, Mexico, um, and, and kind of what our group is known for is we get involved in the expiration timeline. We'll take something, whether it's the first drill hole or something where we see that we can make new discoveries and grow it and then look to vend it off to one of the major mining companies. And we've done that multiple times in the past. We've got, you know, a number of projects right now that I think are at a, you know, a point where they're definitely going to be something that's going to be bought by one of the major mining companies within our group and the three companies. So, 
again, we, we get a lot of the funds. We get a lot of investors involved with our group that follow us from deal to deal because they respect the work that we do. They know our reputation for doing high quality exploration work and our nose for discoveries. Um, and it tends you know, to give us a leg up over a lot of our competition because we get a lot of property submissions first before other people get a look at things. People come to us, they'll do, you know, the producers will do joint ventures with our companies earlier than they would on other ones because they know, you know, the work that we do. So, and, and it lets us share the GNA costs amongst all of, you know, our, our group. So again, the burden rate's much lower, but also have, you know, the expertise of, you know, these senior geologists that look at all the projects within all the different companies in the group and bounce their ideas and bounce their past experiences, you know, off, which I think is invaluable. Here you can see, I mean, I obviously people that are, you know, if you've got capital to deploy right now, I think it's a very good time in our sector to be looking to deploy capital and pick away at, you know, what a lot of these companies are sitting at close to their year lows. Um, you know, it's just been a function of what's been going on in the US with these interest rate hikes and in Canada. Um, but it just, it, you know, it creates an opportunity. And when you see the rebound from these types of markets happen, it tends to be the gold and silver stocks that rebound first and rebound quite aggressively. You know, the last one we saw was, the correction and i was i remember being at the red cloud conference when you know the bottom fell out early in covid um right as it started and you had about a you know month-long very aggressive sell-off there and then within a couple of months the companies were back or exceeding their all-time highs so again i think it's a great opportunity to get involved in our case we've definitely de-risked the project quite a bit with what we've already found and we're certainly heavily undervalued like most should say but we definitely are with our resource and what we're sitting on already and the potential for additional discoveries. You can see some of the, the funds that own the stock there, but again, there's probably over 20 different funds that own our, our company, management retail positions. And then if you're interested in research, um, Dave Talbot has you know very excellent um, coverage on the company and and you can look at him and, and his target prices and that that he has on the project or on the, on the company. I won't spend too much time on this, but it's become more and more important over the last couple of years to start including this in, in the presentations. It's stuff that we've always done, but the idea of ESG and what you're doing um, in the local communities and highlighting it is important. You know, we've been big on recycling water with amongst our jewelry, putting pressure on the drilling company to use some of the newer equipment that's out there to be more efficient on that front, you know, re using recycling around the project, providing local stuff to the community. You know, during COVID and that, we've been providing medicine to that local community, supporting them with medical equipment, um, supporting the schools and the, and the churches and everything that we can. You know, that's our workforce. They're our local partners. We have overwhelming support for the project from those local communities. They've been great. Um, and again, I think that's very important. Um, but it's also become, you know, a check mark for a lot of the funds and large investors that own you that they need to make sure that you're you're contributing and doing things on those fronts. So it's something we've always done. It's always been very important to us, but we've got a couple of slides included in here now to start showing off some of the stuff that we're doing. In summary, we've got a high quality asset, a mining friendly jurisdiction. Again, Sonora is the number one gold producing state in Mexico, and so it's about third on the silver producing side. Uh, strong management technical team behind the project, lots of blue sky potential and strong shareholder support behind the company. With that, I think we can open up to some questions and, and some between Timothy and I. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve, for the informative presentation. Uh, we'll now start the Q&A portion of this webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Um, we already do have a, a few questions here. Um, first, uh, looking at the deposit, El Ruby is your main deposit right now. Do you see as much potential uh, in the other zones as you see at El Ruby? And you had mentioned especially El Molino um, during the presentation. Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of blue sky. But I didn't go into you know we've even got to the north we've got la gloria which sits at a, the crossroads of our major structure and a major east-west structure and that's a three kilometer by three kilometer zone of alteration that looks like it could be a large porphyry so i mean it's not our focus but that's definitely something of interest down the road um whether that's a secondary mine potentially on the grounds or you know if you can make a porphyry discovery but it's not what our focus has been i agree so the southern end el molino is you know, highly prospective and, and exciting. I think Macho Libre itself would be crazy if you didn't, you know, you see these deposits as you move up that structure northwards from 
Las Latas, Con Virginia, La Virginia, where where mine finders and Pan American were focused. Then you've got kind of about a four to five kilometer gap, and you've got you know we've got El Oriental and a couple of these other areas that have some old scratchings and old workings, and then they had some success on. But then you got Molino, or sorry, Macho Libre for two kilometers of strike there, and we've hit mineralization, and it would be insane to think that there's nothing in Macho Libre, it's just hitting it in the right spot and finding that sweet spot where you get, you know, those blowouts of mineralization, but I very high on Macho Libre as well. Um, Peridonis is interesting. You know, there's, there's a lot of targets and, you know, <laughs> there's going to be additional El Rubies in that area or, or additional less what, I mean, like what mine finders and Pan American found, which we're hitting great grades and we're high grade structures. So there's definitely a lot more to be offered. Um, I mean, like say El Ruby is special because it sits on that plateau. And so that from an open pit mining is, you know, there's not, there's, there's not additional plateaus. Um, you get semi flatter areas on parts of Macho Libre, but nothing like what El Ruby is. So that, that is very exciting. And then as you get further North, you can get like the glory is a pretty big open area as well. If you have a big porphyry there. Great. And uh, current resources appear to be focused mainly on near surface mineralization. Um, might you might you also examine more of, uh, for example, deeper gold shoots and potential for for underground gold and silver? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I said, that that's high up on our list as far as the next drill program. We'll be testing those deeper targets, trying to expand and build an underground resource, especially at El Ruby where we've already got some of that high grade material that's below the existing resource in the pit. So no, I, there definitely will be a target of developing hopefully what is a large, very rich underground resource on, on El Ruby above and beyond that starting open pit resource. Great. Um, and then looking forward a bit here, uh, when might you consider a, an updated resource or work toward a PEA? Um, and is further metallurgical work uh, to be required in, in the near term? Yeah, we definitely want to do some additional metallurgical work. Um, like again, especially as, if, if we're, as we're developing an underground resource, we want to show how, you know, that high grade material, which I, like I said, would report to a secondary circuit, I would imagine on this, you're not going to want to put, you know, 20 plus gram gold material and 300 gram silver material onto a leach pad. You'd want to process that a little bit differently and make sure you're recovering more of that type of material in a targeted way. So we want to show the kind of metallurgical methods that those would be recovered on and that you can recover that silver, what I would, you know, hopefully up, you know, high 80s into the 90% range and the gold continuing to, you know, recover it by a different method, that method in a 90 plus percent range. Um, so yes, there'll be different additional metallurgical work. Um, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> um, updated resource or PEA? Updated resource. Yeah, I would I would expect the next, I don't think we'll do a PEA on the next resource, probably the resource after that I could see doing a PEA. You know, if we continue to expand Ruby rapidly, then, then maybe the PEA gets held off on. But if we start to find the boundaries to that portion of the zone, then we probably look at doing a PA on the resource after that, on that portion of the project at least. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, looking at the, at the jurisdiction a bit, obviously Mexico is known for being a mining jurisdiction and Sonora has active mining, but there always are, are sways in, in governments and, and uh, always, always, working with local people so how can you comment a bit on the social aspects of working in sonora mexico how supportive are the locals the locals are incredibly supportive the, the locals and even the state government are extremely supportive mining is the number one industry in the state they have a rich mining history they have no intention of ever doing anything to mining or affecting mining it's it's definitely what the state of you know it's known for mining and then probably beef <laughs> the two main industries in that part of mexico um, so again, very overwhelming support. Obviously, you know, that question comes up a lot when you look on a federal level and, and the party that's in control of Mexico right now is definitely more leftist and, and has made some public statements that, to draw, you know, definitely get your attention. You want to pay attention to, um, I, I think a lot of that is towing the party line and in, into the constituents. And again, me mining in Mexico is so ingrained into their system and their history and their blood and, and some of the most powerful families in Mexico control, you know, like Fresno and, and you know, uh, that that's owned by the 50% of that is owned by the, you know, one of the most wealthiest families in Mexico. And so it's not something that you're going to mess with in Mexico and get away for very long on a political level. So I, 
you definitely pay attention. There's definitely been certain things they've done that have made it harder to stake ground or taken longer to process claims and different things. But overall, I mean, again, it's been very easy to continue working in Mexico. This regime's been in now for you know quite a few years and nothing has really changed on the precious metals front or mining front too dramatically. So again, I mean, it's, it's a very good country for exploring for, especially on the silver side, it's the number one silver producing country in the world. Um, you want to talk about a shortage of silver and what could be coming on those. I mean, you look at what's gone on in Chile and Peru and, you know, like you said, a lot of the silver comes as byproducts and a lot of those big porphyries that produce those byproducts are in those countries. So again, you're sitting there with Mexico, the one that's still been open for business and has still had things in production and, you know, Again, I don't think there's a better place to be looking for a silver deposit and operating than Mexico. Great. Um, and we had a couple of questions here, more on the um, um, kind of cash. What is the current cash position? What is the the cash burn rates? Are you do you have enough capital for drilling and the option payment due next June? No, we'll have we'll have to do another capital raise. We did a small raise. You know, in the summer, just to try and ride out this bad market, um, we're sitting at around, you know, somewhere under a million bucks in cash. But we've, you know, been able fully financed to do what we need to do in the interim. Um, we would like to do a larger raise at some point here in the near future to get back and, and run the large drill program that we think that <laughs> the project warrants, you know, in, in a regular market. Like we always said, I said I would have been adding rigs and expanding the program. And instead, you know, we're trying to be smart and, you know, keep the company going and not put pressure on the balance sheet um you know so we did a small raise just to continue going you know it's been a very challenging finance market as i'm sure you and a lot of your colleagues have been aware of moving through you know kind of from the start of summer and you know we wanted to do a raise sooner but we're continually told like it's just there's it's not there for any companies you know from the start of summer it was just People's share prices were going down. If you tried to announce a raise, you weren't getting it done and you were just lowering your share price. So we tried to wait it out as long as we possibly could, but ended up doing a small raise just to you know, make sure that obviously the company didn't go broke and bankrupt and not be able to pay bills. Um, but we would like to do a larger raise at some point and, and ramp up and like you say, add, get multiple rigs going on the project again, test it deep, test a lot of these different anomalies and targets and look to make additional discoveries and what we that's what we should be doing right now, but the market isn't allowing that to happen. And and then thinking kind of longer term at the corporate strategy, um, would you look eventually to become a producer, or would you look obviously with with Orco the the group has a, a background of of uh, discovery and uh, and then eventually selling to an established producer. Yeah, I mean our. Our model has always been to sell to one of the producers. We've got excellent geologists, exploration geologists, but we're not mining engineers. We're not the guys that built the mine. We've seen a lot of hiccups with a lot of our our peers through the years that try to do that. You know, they they were exploration geologists. They make a discovery, but they don't want to give up their baby, and they try and take it to production, and then their shareholders suffer for it. And I think that's why you see a lot of the shareholders that we have. They understand how you know strict we are with our projects that they don't match our model, we move on. We don't continue to drill something on a dream and a hope that one one hole is gonna change the future of a project where we are very cautious about cash and where it's spent to make sure that we're doing the right way and, and people tend to respect us for that. So, um, you know, that that's definitely our model. You know, if something came up and it made sense to do some small, I mean, I, I don't know what that would be, but it's not in our, it's not in our plan, but, you know, I'm never going to shut myself off. There's been a couple of companies that have approached us that have the teams to be able to to mine, and they've been interested in La Virginia and potentially, you know, kind of proving a concept. And then they are the type of company that would look to sell it off to a producer after. And, and we would look at something like that maybe if, if they have the expertise to be able to put, you know, the guys that can build the mine and get there it. for acquisitions or or potentially, you know, one thought is mergers among uh, juniors uh, kind of to combine resources. Yeah, no, there's definitely opportunities that we've been looking at, and I can't go into too much detail on that front, but for obvious reasons, but no, there's definitely some projects that we've had our eye on and companies that are struggling that we think have, you know, superb assets that could be 
potentially merged with for very cheap that could be you know major catalyst and be huge for the company moving forward one of the things i've always wanted is to have a second asset in the company for when we do do that transaction with one of the big mining companies and to have an asset that we can spin out and almost as a free dividend to shareholders but basically is a free dividend to shareholders where they'll get the transaction cost but end up with a new share for free and a new vehicle and another exciting project so no that's very important i think the, there is a lot of opportunities out there right now to potentially you know take advantage of some of these other juniors because everyone's in the same boat i mean we we all be very frustrated with our share price but everyone else has gone down by the same amount or more you know as silver viper in a lot of the cases so the the opportunity there to merge with someone else who's been hit even harder and and then to you know like you say build a bigger stronger company out of it i think is something that if the right opportunity presents itself we're going to jump all over it great um and looking at potential catalysts here um are there any additional drilling results or, or things out there uh in the in the near to midterm um that we might look forward to from the company potentially even before another another fundraise so. yeah there, there won't be any more drill results we've got all of our drill results out um the potential i mean we're running a large mapping and sampling program so you're going to see potentially some grade or, or announcements on samples on some of those other targets as we make, you know, kind of some of these new areas that we identified, we're trying to get them to be drill ready targets. So that would be kind of the news that I would expect in the short term as if, you know, we put out some results on that front, we would like to put out, we should put out a summary result of the geophysics program and the 3D part of the geophysics at some point summarizing, but we've you kind of, I mean, people now have seen it in the presentation, so maybe we don't do release, but, it, you know, they've seen a lot of results and the excitement that we have as a company around what we saw in a lot of that geophysics, um, you know, and then, and then, like you said, at some point we'll have, we'll be announcing a raise, hopefully at much higher prices than we're at today, but I can't control the market. So we'll see where we're at and what's going on um, out there. In, the investment world absolutely absolutely great well i think that's all the questions uh we have right now steve um i'd like to again thank steve cope ceo of uh, silver viper and thanks everyone out there for tuning in 